You're listening to the Ask Drone You podcast. You ask, we answer your drone questions. Whether you're here to turn your passion into profit or you simply fly for fun, we're a community of learners and teachers who aspire to achieve greatness. We are Drone You. Hey everyone and welcome to a very interesting episode of Ask Drone You. My name is Paul. My name is Rob. Thank you for joining us. We're super excited to be here for another show with you. Really appreciate you spending a few minutes of your day with us. Go to askdroneu.com to get your questions, your comments, your thoughts in. We'd love to hear from you as uh, this show is all about you. So take a couple minutes. We know you got stuff on your mind and we know other people have that same thing on their mind. So we'd love to hear from you and hope to uh, do so soon. Definitely. We do. We do hope so. Uh, that said, greatly appreciate you joining us. If you have a question, go to askadroneu.com. I uh, got an interesting question today regarding starting running a drone program and also better understanding uh, the registration process, managing information, etc. So uh, we, well, I say we just get right into it. Yeah. Um, but because today's show uh, kind of talks about some things that we offer through the props program, I thought it was very relevant to say the sponsor for today's show is our props educational platform. Whether you are a drone manufacturer, whether you are a drone team or a program, the props educational platform was built for you. Easily manage multiple pilots, get real-time status notifications on those pilots and their training progress. Know exactly what they've learned and what they haven't. Know who has retained the information, who is current, but more importantly, who is proficient. Manage all of your pilots all of your equipment, all of your forms in one dashboard to make it easy and simple to run your drone program. Because after all, you've got to get it going, but you got to keep it growing. That's why you should check out the props programs. Just go to props.thedroneu.com. Hey, Paul and Rob. This is Andrew in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. I've been a listener for a little over a year now, and I love your guys' content. I work for a large construction company that spans the entire United States. For the last five or six months, I've been working on a proposal with a team of people in North Carolina to start a drone program. We've already got a Matrice 300 with a P1 on the way. We've got processing software picked, and we also have an insurance policy drafted in our corporate office. My first question for you guys is registration. When our Matrice comes, I plan to register in my name so we can get in the air immediately. However, I recognize that the paper application that takes a couple weeks to process will allow us to register in the company's name. So should I leave the company, it doesn't go with me, the registration that is. Is there a way that I can register the drone in my name and then when I submit the paper application for the company, they have it immediately transfer over? My next question is regarding insurance and my liability as a pilot. Is there anything that you suggest looking out for in our insurance policy to make sure that I as a pilot don't get sued if something happens and I'm working for the company? I want to protect my personal liability while I'm doing work for the company. My third question is, do you have any recommendations for online inventory management and or checklist software? Ideally, it'd be something that could manage inventory and pre and post flight checklists especially if they have the ability to do custom checklists. I look forward to hearing your response. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. Really appreciate it. Sounds like an exciting time, um, but also a lot of work. Starting these drone programs, it's a big, it's a very big endeavor, especially for a company like the size of what it sounds you're working for, which is countrywide. That's a that's a big undertaking. It is a big undertaking, and that's also why it's so important to be able to manage all data aspects of the program from one given place. You know, it really does make it easier. Mm-hmm. That said, he's got a lot of questions, and so I tried to write some of them down to be able to hit them <clears throat> sequentially. Um, and I also will say that these problems have been... Uh, Uh, you know, they've existed for years. Mm -hmm. There really hasn't been a good solution. This is kind of why we built the props program because we've seen these issues become rampant. We have seen issues, very simple ones, shut programs down. 
And that's actually why we built this props program. Um, and before we get into it, you know, he's, he's like, is there anywhere where we can manage all of our equipment and all of our pilot checklists and resources and documentations in one area? Um, the props program does offer that. Now, uh, with the public safety program, we're currently building all the resources into what we call the pilot binder, the admin binder. And then all of those things kind of talk to each other in the back end of Google Docs. We do offer resources in Pilot and Mapper to help people run their programs, their pre-flight checklists, et cetera. And we have digitized them so that they can speak to each other. But we need to record a video in props to say, this is how you copy all of this and make your own secure solution, either through Google Docs or through uh, Adobe's system, because some people prefer one or the other. Because mm -hmm. Adobe Fill and Sign doesn't need live internet in order to work or cache information. Like, one of the big issues is if you're using any uh, pre-flight checklist, like in Google Docs, you fill out half the form, you put your phone in your pocket, five minutes later you pull it back out, the page will refresh, and you, all that stuff will, will get lost, which is uh, a problem. Even if you do have offline data mode on, I don't want to hear, uh, I want to avoid those comments right now, um, it doesn't cache the information inside of the box. It's very frustrating. It is, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, but we do have these resources in the props program. And so I will just say, if you are looking to aggregate all of your um, pre-flight checklists and whatnot, you can even customize them, and they're still all going to feed into one location. In addition to that, the props program also has equipment management built in, so you can see all the drones that are in there, all the batteries that are in there, the procurement process, so if you're government or an, uh, a government agency, um, you can see how those were paid for, et cetera, what fun funding sources were used. Uh, so it was really built to provide as much uh, information uh, as possible into, again, one particular uh, dashboard. But let's, uh, let's go sequentially through his questions. So he talks about he wants to register uh, the drone in his name so he can get up and running faster. I'm not sure I, fall, I track that line of thinking. Instead of registering the drone in the business's name, and he said that he wants to go through the, the paper application. So for any of you who are newer drone pilots, what does he mean by the paper application? He's talking about actually physically applying for an N number, which is a traditional aircraft number. Uh, now, there are actually not enough N numbers to go around for all the drone pilots. That's why the FAA came up with a separate registration system uh, for drone pilots as a whole. We got part 47, part 48. Um now, that said, there is still one benefit of having that N number over part 47 and 48. Do you know what it is? It's about flying in certain places. I'm talking about internationally. Um, so the FAA says you're good to go on flying internationally because the end number system is recognized everywhere. But I actually start to question that, Rob, because so many countries are coming up with their own drone registration systems. You're like, okay, does it does it really transcribe to these other places or not? Do they really even care? Most times, no. Uh, so I'm not really sure why he would use the paper process. I mean, we had classes on that what, eight years ago? Uh, and, you know, we had the end number on one of our old Inspires, and now I just use the, the digital system because I really don't see the benefit or uh, see why take up someone's time in Oak City to register a drone in that way. Um, so that said, you know, he mentioned going back and forth on registering the drone in his name versus the company name. Right. Uh, quick aside on this, um, I know that there are FAA specific rules about the drones registered to a pilot or whatever, but in today's day and age with data mismanagement and in today's day and age where someone can go online and look up my information and show up at my office or my house with nefarious intentions... I have even, you know, in, in like buying a house, I want to buy a house under a company name. I don't want my personal information tied anywhere uh, out there. And when you buy a house, that information is going to MLS, that information is going to all these county registries, these state information boards, and your information gets sold three or four X over. Well, the number one place is the credit bureaus and they sell it to everybody and their dog. 
Uh, yeah. So yes, per- point taken. Yeah, and so and that's my thing is like you know what I honestly kind of don't care about what certain people say about register under a name or register under a company. It's like well until a bunch of people can prove that a they can actually manage my data and it not get lost. Which by the way, Experian got hacked. I was a part of that. Um, and I hate that we have a credit system that, oh yeah, we can just lose all your data and whatever. And it affects your credit score and sorry, you know, it's like, well, F you, you know, like, <laughs> like, uh, no, you know, I'm going to go out of my way so I don't have to use a credit system because this is broken. This doesn't actually work for people. And so when it comes to personal information, my personal opinion on putting personal information is I would say no. I would say register it under uh, a company name anyway. Like even if it said first and last name, I would put drone and then last name you. You know what I, I mean? do that often actually. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. So I, mean, I obviously do a lot of things for the company and it, I put that 90% of the time. Depends on what it is. but Yeah. And then if it says that's not a valid last name, name, then I'll say drone you company or something. <laughs> they, or ink or, yeah, right. or yeah, 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 yeah. I like that. I know the FAA has particular rules and regulations regarding whether it should be, uh, you know, registered under um, a person or a company or whatever. I'm not sure this this is a hill they're going to die on, frankly. Um, and honestly, I would say register it under the company name, no matter where which way you go. I would also recommend you just register the drone online through the FAA's website. Um, it's five bucks and you're done. It's right there. So and you can do that under a company name. I think so. I, I, I honestly don't remember. Um, but that said, personally speaking, and this kind of may or may not defy what regulations say, I would say put it under a company name. Um, so insurance, he said, is there any other questions that I should be asking about my insurance coverage? Rob, I know you've been deep into the rabbit hole of insurance lately, and uh, I actually want to do a show. I'm tr- I can't say the name of the production company, but I'm trying to see if I can get uh, Jim uh, on from huge production company mm-hmm. to come on and talk to pilots about like, hey, you know, everyone online and YouTube says that you need aviation insurance to fly on set. That's not true. You need this and this and this and this in order to actually get hired. Interesting. And so, uh, and that might be a members only show because frankly, uh, I think that people who want to do things right deserve that information. Yeah. Um, and s- well, I mean, the bottom line is he's asking, how do I protect myself? Right. And so a couple of questions that come up and uh, that come to mind are, does the insurance cover you if you're technically flying indoors? What about training? Um, does the insurance policy also specify that you're constantly following FAA guidelines? Most of them do, which is, uh, again, back to Brendan Shulman's comment on his exit interview that, you know, make sure the drones that you buy, you're not just listening to the marketing and the hype. You have to actually be able to fully control these drones at any given time in order for them to comply with FAA guidelines. And there are drones out there, and they're blue, uh, that don't do that. So, I mean, I would say, uh, I would say, you know, well, no, I mean, like, I think this is like the epitome of the issue, right? Because you get a company that has a drone program, they're trusting this guy to know the FAA guidelines, he gets insurance, let's say he's flying that drone, he has a mishap, and the claims adjuster says, well, were you following all FAA guidelines. Could you do this? Could you do that? Could you do this? Could you do that? And frankly, uh, he, you know, if you were like, well, no, I, I couldn't control the drone over everything else. The autonomy was in control. Then he's technically not following FAA guidelines. And the insurance company could say, no, we're not covering this. And what if there was hundreds of thousands of dollars in damage? You know, I know that the propensity of that happening is rare, but it is possible. And so now this guy ruins his whole career all because there's not transparent information out there. I mean, that's kind of why, I mean, this exact example is kind of why I've been so stalwart uh, on that that issue. So, um, but I think it's an important question to ask. Um, that said, another thing I think that you should look at is, are there any protocols on pilot maintenance, like how often they should be practicing, how often they should be flying their currency, uh, et cetera? And then, you know, Rob, the, his last point was, where can I find a place for data management, pre-flight management, equipment management? We kind of already hit that in the beginning of the show. We recommend the the props program. We now even have data integrations with things like Air Data. if you want more information. Um, so I obviously am going to recommend, uh, that product because we looked at a lot of stuff that was out there and built what we have based off of where we saw areas of opportunity. 
Well, including and perhaps most importantly, how uh, up to date the training is for your for your group of pilots. Ah. Right. I mean, that's obviously the the main thing behind props. But um, that's actually a really important point. We shouldn't just kind of glaze over that because one of our very, you know what, dude, one of our clients in insurance, remember what they said? We have to do training recency every single year. They've got to be going through a program every single year. Yeah. And they insure drones. And so that makes me think, huh, that's a really good question is how often do they have to prove proficiency through an in-person training or an online? training, you know? When you ask that how often you're talking about the, the particular company's program, what, what is their protocol for yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely something that, um, y'all need to be thinking about Andrew and I'm sure you are, but that's another thing that props can do is, is help with that. But, you know, in terms of the insurance, I think you bring up a lot of good points. I just don't want to leave Andrew with more worry than, than, um, anything else coming out of this. Okay. And the reality is particularly with a company as big as you're working for, it sounds like essentially if you're working for the company, the laws of insurance, the rules of insurance state that the company is responsible for any accidents that you have. And that's kind of just the nature of how it works. Which is interesting when you consider that the FAA says that the pilot is ultimately responsible. Right? Yeah. You know? Yeah, that's, tr that's true. Does the tail wag the dog or the dog wag the tail? <laughs> I mean, that's why we've said for years, right, yeah. who really controls the drone industry. And we've said for years, it's not the FAA. Right. It is the insurance companies, you know. And I mean, Ted was the the person who taught us that. And yeah. I, he's right. You know, if insurance says, hey, you can't fly and you've got a, a 777 loaded with people on the runway, you think United is going to let you take off? Hell no. Yeah, you know the other thing, Andrew, in your position, um, we're speaking specifically to somebody like you working for a company like this, you probably have at least one person, if not more than that, that's a big part of their responsibility is making sure the insurance is is solid for this company. Yeah. So talk to them. <laughs> so, okay, I have a question uh, for you. Uh, so in regards, we've been really talking about aviation insurance. Do you recommend that his program have any type of GL insurance or well, other forms? Well, that's my point. For a company like this, it is going to have, the, the liability insurance that a company like this is going to carry is going to be so robust. I mean, imagine the, the equipment they have all over the country doing all sorts of different things on any given day, insurance, I assure you, is one of their most high priorities as a company. Oh, yeah. So you're just essentially plugging into that. But have a conversation with them. I'm sure they'll be able to tell you why you're okay. But I'm sure you're okay. You know, I just had a, a crazy little daydream sitting here next to you. But how far away are we from the flows of the progressive world saying, we'll fly drones over your construction site and do a safety audit right there and lower your insurance premiums because we can see you're doing everything right. <laughs> well, the, the one client we have, they're probably very close to doing that already. Oh, that was a very good point. I, I didn't even think about that. Probably part of why they're doing it. Yeah, that's a very powerful point. Anyways. Yeah, client who shall go unnamed. Good stuff, Andrew. It's uh, very exciting excited for you and, and for your company. It uh, makes a lot of sense. It sure does. And uh, thanks for the question. We really yeah. do appreciate it. If you have a question, audience, ask DroneU.com. Really want to hear those business questions. Uh, the mapping world is evolving at such an insane pace. And the, the Phantom 4 Pro remains the powerhouse. Uh, and the amount of things that you can do with mapping just continues to blossom. So uh, mapping, business, scaling, creative questions, bring them on in. And we've got some more success stories coming up. But uh, greatly appreciate everyone who, uh, who has joined us, who has supported us. We appreciate you members. And uh, uh, don't be don't be afraid to take a look at the Black Friday sales that are coming up very quickly. But thanks again for joining us. My name is Paul. I'm Rob. This is Ask Drone You.